Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about bringing together mental and substance use disorder treatment and recovery services. Joining us in our panel today are Becky Sterling, Director of the Office of Recovery Services, Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services, Richmond, Virginia. Kathy Devaney McKay, President and Chief Executive Officer of Connections Community Support Programs, Incorporated, Wilmington, Delaware. Donna Hillman, Project Officer of the Pacific Jurisdictions, Division of State and Community Assistance, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. Anita Everett, Chief Medical Officer at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. So Donna, why are we moving towards the integration of mental and substance use disorder treatment services into primary care? Well, I think what, that we've dealt with people with mental health and substance use disorders um, kind of outside the primary health care system for a long time. And people with those kind of disorders generally tend to have major health problems also, lots of times because of lack of um, access to health care and, and other um, issues that arise for them. But in order to treat all of the conditions and make sure that the person is on the road to wellness and is able to reach their full potential, we need to stop compartmentalizing their their problems. We need to move it all together so that all of the professionals that impact their lives can work together in a coordinated way and on a recovery plan that puts them on the road to wellness. Very good, Donna. Thank you. Um, and, and Becky, what are the factors or characteristics that facilitate the integration of these services? Because it can't really be that easy to do. Obviously, Donna has mentioned that there's some other medical conditions that though, of those that have a mental and substance use disorder, sort of like high blood pressure, diabetes, and other uh, physical medical conditions. So I think some of the factors that would facilitate integrating behavioral health, mental health, and substance use disorder into care is realizing the person is a whole entity and that when one thing goes wrong in my life, it affects every aspect of my life. When one thing goes correctly in my life, it also affects every aspect of my life. So when I go to a treatment provider and they're willing to look at me as a total person to respond to my needs in their entirety, it helps me find my pathway to recovery. It helps me become a partner in that treatment. Very good, and Dr. Everett, what are, uh, or, or, or what should a system look like? What should a well-integrated system look like? One of the ways I like to think about systems uh, is in, in uh, what they should ideally look like is starting with the perspective of the consumer or the patient who needs the system. And so if you start with that, what would you want if you had that kind of thing? You would want one entryway, one sort of way into the system and one system that was coordinated around you. And so people really want that these days and fortunately they've grown to expect that more. Uh, and so that's what we, the system needs to be able to deliver to the person, is to have them be able to get as much as possible in one site. We're all busy and have lots of different things going on, and having one place that sort of serves as your home, your health home, um, broadly, is really what we need. And so uh, I think that's very important for systems to be tuned into, one language word for it is person-centered care, but something that emanates around what would you want if you had these conditions. So Kathy, I suspect that what we would want is for that system to be able to assess me and what other um, uh, elements uh, uh, within that care that is provided should we be looking at? Right, so I would think we want the system to be able to assess every aspect. We want it to be able to assess whether or not there's a mental disorder, whether there's a substance use disorder, and whether there are other co-occurring physical disorders. And um, ideally, in my mind, the, the thing that would work the best would be that the primary care for those things would be delivered all in one place. Uh, sometimes, obviously, 
obviously you're going to detect something that's going to require specialty care, but that someone does not have to go from their primary care physician to a mental health service deliverer to a substance use service deliverer, but can get everything in that one place. And so Donna, are there challenges to, to doing this? I think there are a number of challenges to doing this. I think our system has been set up um, kind of like the primary health care system where you have a, a primary care physician, but then you go to specialists when you have special care and everything. And I think that uh, the mental health disorders and substance use disorders are so intricately tied to the health and wellness, primary medical health and wellness of an individual. I think those barriers um, need to be addressed and I think we can do that simply by forming the appropriate partnerships and having um, kind of a locality-wide group that sees it as, you know, there's only one person sitting in front of us. We can't treat them adequately by sending them all over the county looking for services. But Becky, specifically, you, you are involved in recovery support services, uh, you know, in, in, in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so what challenges uh, have you uh, faced and how, what is the best way of overcoming them? So I think some of the challenges are the things that we've learned in the past. And as research has evolved and people's awareness evolved, I'm not sure that's always gotten hold of by the people that need it. So education, um, exposing people to what's new and what's current and what's working. But there's also another aspect and that's bringing in a teammate to treatment teams of a person with lived experience because it's that person who truly understands to the core of their being what it feels like. When I go into crisis, I'm not thinking about my recovery. I'm not thinking about anything except get me out of this state. I don't know the answers. I don't have the answers. So to have both professionals that understand that I'm a total human being and you cannot treat just one part of me, but you have to treat all of me and also have someone else that's been there and can walk beside me as I find my pathways to recovery. I really like the idea that the person themselves is the driver of their health care. Um, and I think that in the past, health care workers have been set on pedestals that they themselves don't even like. Um, and, and treat it as if they have to have the answer. They have to fix things, they have to solve things. When in fact what people want is tools so that they can fix and solve and help themselves. So I think about the education of people coming into the profession. I also think about hurdle being how we treat, how we pay for it. Mm -hmm. How we pay for it is so linked and should be to outcomes. And we're going to get to that in a, a little bit later on. But Dr. Everett, there are benefits for, as, as Becky was just noting, there are benefits for the, the people that are coming through to receive services. And what are some of the other benefits for individuals as they approach uh, a more integrated system? Well, I think having a similar kind of mindset and an approach, uh, it, we've used the word team a lot, and sometimes that's a real team of individuals who sit, or, sit together and talk with, some, uh, pe with the patient or the, the consumer. Sometimes it's a virtual team, um, but it's still a grouping of people that are around uh, that are aligned in the same direction. And so how, what does that look like? A person in sustained recovery may not need, well, you know, we should not need the level of intensity of specialty care or things like that anymore, but it's very handy if their primary care doctor in the primary care health system knows that they've had issues and works with them throughout with regards to pain management or other things that come up. And sort they, of as to monitor. Uh, as a, to monitor, mm -hmm. right, and help sort of be part of that team that follows them. Right. So, Kathy, how does the nonprofit sector fit into an integrated system with primary care? Well, in some places, in Delaware is one of them, all of the care is delivered by the nonprofit sector. Uh, Delaware doesn't deliver any services directly, so they're all contracted to nonprofits. Um, when I think about this, and one of the challenges that uh, we've found recently is that some of the people that we treat in our assertive community treatment teams for, for severe and persistent mental illness have developed opioid use disorders. Uh, mm -hmm. That didn't used to happen so much, but with the opioid epidemic, they're doing that. Um, 
an, a sort of community treatment team can't be an OTP, so they have to go to one of our OTPs for treatment. And the integration of those two services, when they're even delivered in the same building, but by slightly different treatment providers, has been a challenge. So I think that uh, the where the rubber kind of meets the road in a lot of places is in that nonprofit sector where that treatment on the street is being delivered, whether it's at the Fairly Qualified Health Center or the nonprofit, well, even the community services boards are nonprofits to an extent. They're a little bit different, but they have nonprofit status. So all of that service is really delivered in the nonprofit sector. Well, when we come back, we're going to continue to talk about the interaction be the, between the states and the nonprofit sector and the primary care facilities. We'll be right back. The report called Facing Addiction in America is very important. It's a landmark report, um, and it's intended for the people in America uh, to promote recovery and to, to uh, promote improvement in the services delivery system, the addiction services delivery system. It's intended for a wide variety of people. It's intended for families and people directly affected, but it's also intended for health care providers at large, including primary care providers. Um, each of the chapters is useful as a standalone chapter or a modular kind of thing, but they also work together to create a whole uh, resource. Um, one of the um, uh, important things about the report is it, that it really spells out the current science with regards to the biology and the biologic basis of these addiction conditions. My mental health challenges started in September 2001. As they began, I started a journey that brought me forth to today, to a point where I look back to who I was and I look at who I am today, and I'm glad that I took that journey. Recovery for me means that I am more today than I was yesterday, and that I get to live my life and be in charge of it rather than having situations, experiences, and other people in charge of my life. So what I would say to those individuals that think that they may have those challenges is be brave, take that first step, it's worth it, um, find people that you can trust, uh, and speak out and speak up. Staying on course without support is tough. With help from family and community, you get valuable support for recovery from a mental or substance use disorder. Join the Voices for Recovery. Visible. Vocal. Valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. Dr. Everett, what are some of the key principles that primary health care systems need to apply when integrating mental and substance use disorders? A very important one is to have, uh, you know, have leadership that's very on board with the whole mission of this. And I myself believe one of the easiest ways to do that and sort of line up everything is to always remember what's best for the patient uh, after all. And sometimes that does mean we have to change the way we organize our services, but keeping centered on that's really what a patient would want after all mm -hmm. uh, is the best way to sort of organize things. I see you nodding, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree with that. I think uh, one of the things I think in terms of primary care, uh, orienting themselves around substance use disorders in particular is that there's a stigma associated with substance use disorders, and sometimes it goes um, as deep as not really asking people the question uh, so that you'll see people go into hospitals, for example, and um, they're withdrawing from heroin and no one knows it, and somebody comes in to give them their illegal drugs to use. So um, sort of focusing on that possibility, especially right now when we have an epidemic of, of heroin use and other opioid use, 
uh, the likelihood is that you're going to have people who are coming into those primary care settings who are using those substances. So Donna, that brings up a good point that what we must institute are best practices. Yes. And how do we do that? I mean, do we look at data? Uh, do we need data to implement best practices? Do we need other elements to integrate those best practices? I think uh, data is very important. I think anytime we implement a best practice or what is to become a best practice, um, evaluation has to be part of that from the very beginning. What is working? What is not working? And just because something is not working in the system that we're trying to develop um, the first time around does not make it a failure. It just means we need to go back and take a look at what we need to change in order to make it more successful. And data and evaluation are extremely strong pieces in, uh, in forging that road and, and moving us down that way. I think um, some of the things that the panelists have um, expressed before, the fact that we need to have everybody on board and we can integrate services, but we have to integrate systems. And sometimes that moves it up to a different level. And you have to have systemic leadership in order to make a, ch a systems change that's really productive and is really positive. And like Dr. Everett said, we need to all remember who's the client, mm -hmm. you know, and what is it that's going to be best for them. So Becky, um, in addition to what Donna has explained, what is really um, uh, necessary? Because we're not just talking about being able to address issues of the opioid epidemic, but sometimes we get individuals that come in with a dual diagnosis, both substance use disorder and mental illness. And how should those systems be prepared to deal with that? So it's interesting. I think a lot of times when we speak of system change, we speak of educating and changing the people who are delivering services. And we forget that we also need to educate and provide opportunities for learning and growth to the people who are receiving those services. As we do that, we need to make sure those voices are included at every level of decision making um, because People come with their own biases, whether you're giving service or receiving services, you have those biases. So giving people opportunities to learn something new, to experience something different, to have a positive health outcome, to... But how do, what does that look like? What does it look like? In other words, like? if I walked in to you today mm -hmm. and, I, and, and I present myself with a dual diagnosis and, and I don't even know that I have it, what, what happens? So it's interesting because using terms like evaluation and assessment um, from a perspective that I carry, which is that peer perspective, what you would be asking me is what's working? What's not working? Um, how are things going? Um, it's, I, I heard someone once refer to a peer as an interpreter that they are interpreting that more clinical language that is necessary and it's, it's required for communication on a certain level. But there's also that fifth grade language, that experiential, that street language. And if all I hear is clinical language, you're scaring me. You're, you're, you're setting up a barrier. So if we all learn how to uh, express ourselves across those boundaries of language, of experience, of knowledge, and, and, and share those in, in a very strong, mutual, uh, human compassion mm -hmm. kind of way, I think then we're truly on the path I of see. system change. That's a very strong, strong component. If I could add something, I was gonna say, one of the things I uh, like to focus on, or one of the roles I like to focus on when I'm teaching younger physicians in particular is the, the concept of partnering. Just like what you're mm -hmm. saying, Becky, you do not consider yourself to be the, the knowing all expert, but rather partnering with the person and respecting their experience. Sometimes I'll even say, you know, well, this, you're the veteran in your experience. You know what medicines you've responded to and not, what kinds of things work for you, what don't. We want to partner with you to help find the path that we're both, uh, both working with. So that, that concept of partner, and actually, as you mentioned earlier, kind of gives a, uh, can be a pressure releaser to the, the students in particular, or you know, med young medical students or, or young people young in their career, that mm -hmm. they don't have to know everything. They just have to know enough to sort of help the person get started and you're going to walk down that path together. 
So it's interesting because in my experience, um, there were times when I went to a therapist because they had a set of knowledge that I didn't have. Um, they knew how to fix some things that I did not know how to fix. They knew, knew how to help me even identify those things. But then I went to my peers for a different level of interaction, a different level of comfort, and, and I actually sometimes even practiced with my peers what I would then take into a more therapeutic setting. And it made it, it made a pathway for me that I felt in control of, but I also felt like people were there partnering with me, were going to help me, were going to boost me up if I fell, mm -hmm. um, if, if and things support started, you and support yeah, me, absolutely. yes. Absolutely, yes. and I think that's critical. Kathy, I wanna go back to the issue of medication-assisted therapies. It's a very important issue. Uh, we know that, that there is a, a prescription misuse epidemic that may lead to then, you know, a, a higher degree of, of use of heroin. And so when we're talking about these integrated systems, what is the best way to integrate those services within the service delivery uh, primary care system? Well, I'll give you an example of something that is happening in Delaware, which I think is really exciting. So our largest hospital system has a chief of addictions medicine who decided that he would use peers uh, in four of his um, hospital units, general hospital units, acute care units, to ask patients there um, if, to assess them to see if they have an opioid use disorder while they're on his unit for other things. So they come in there maybe with trauma from an accident, maybe they have some uh, other condition that would suggest that maybe there is a substance use disorder like an abscess or something like that. And when they identify them, what he does is do a warm, he starts them on buprenorphine while they're in the hospital. And then he does a warm handoff to one of our clinics with using the peers. So one of their peers hands off to one of our peers and we make sure that when the person leaves, they actually get to the clinic. Um, doing that, we've had about a 75% success rate in terms of people getting to the clinic when they leave, which if you didn't do that, it would be about 5% probably. Um, and about uh, over a 90 day period, 50% of them are staying. So that's a, that's that's a high good. percentage of uh, success. So I think that's a good example of something that can be done. And Dr. Everett, I know that there are some myths related to medication-assisted treatment. Do you want to go into this a little bit so that our audience understands it? Yeah, so one of the ideas that we talked a little bit about is, yeah, is, is uh, can you be in uh, recovery if you're in medication-assisted treatment? Isn't that just sort of a, an exchange of addictions? And um, we, that's not the way we frame it at, at all. We, we frame, you know, what, the, many different, there are many different paths to recovery. Uh, everyone has their own path. Mm -hmm. And um, recovery is about having uh, hope and uh, uh, life in the community, purpose to your to your situation and to your to your life, so that whatever it takes to get in that direction is, is what we want to encourage. And so sometimes it is medication, sometimes it's not medication, sometimes it's with a therapist, sometimes it's with a psychiatrist or doctor. It's diff many different pathways to recovery, and we want to work with that. We don't at all. Our our current uh, definition of recovery doesn't. Uh, separate out people who are on medication or not on medication. Mm -hmm. It's whatever it takes for you and your unique uh, situation. Again, recognizing the expertise of the person in managing their own recovery. And Donna, very quickly, mm -hmm. were you going to say something? I, I was just going to say that I, I think it brings it all back to that the services that we provide and the system that we create has to be client driven. We have to, we, the first question we need to ask them is how can I help you? What I wanted to expand on, Donna, it's client-driven and it's also no wrong door. Do you want to explain very quickly what that no wrong door concept is all about? I've been a proponent of no, no wrong door for a long time. Um, what that means is that no matter where the client hits the system, whether it's in the emergency room, whether it's in the primary care physician's office, whether it's in a substance use disorder um, setting or a mental health setting, mental health disorder setting, there is no wrong door for them to become part of a system that's going to be comprehensive and assist them in reaching their stage of wellness and their road to recovery. Excellent. Well, when we come back, I want to be able to expand on that and then get into some of the policies and the financing of these systems. We'll be right back.
Planning District 1 Community Services Board is part of a network of services that are all throughout Virginia. It's a mountainous community. This is a coal mining area. This is a timbering area. All of our services really revolve around three areas, one of which is substance use disorders, another is mental health disorders, and the third would be intellectual disabilities. I think one of the great things about Plain District 1 Frontier Health is that um, we do a lot with a little, and we're always saying, what else can we do? All healthcare delivery services are diagnosis driven. So if there's a diagnosis, there's a mental health diagnosis, and there's a substance use disorder diagnosis, and typically one of those is going to take priority. This is a place that we frankly just don't have resources to do anything other than everything all together. We see a lot of children who have grown up in households where substance use is the norm for, for generations. Um, and they're either experiencing trauma themselves or vicariously experiencing trauma by witnessing substance use, by having to take on a caretaker role many times. Um, and so really addressing that trauma before it, it, it creates a cycle that, that we see with many generations. In addition to training our clinicians to look at both mental health and substance disorder issues, we train community people. And that pulled in juvenile probation, adult probation, social services. Whether it's us going out into the field, we do a lot of home visits, we do a lot of school visits, so working very collaboratively with all of the community partners so we can meet those children and their families' needs. Prevention is the way that we're going to solve the problems we're experiencing now. With addictions, substance use disorders, we can't arrest our way out of this problem. We can't treat our way out of this problem. It has to be prevented. Building coalitions in the community, led by the community, that are empowered and active in changing some of the things that are going on in their communities is really how that prevention comes to be manifested. My recovery started when I was um, late in high school and early in my college career. Um, I was going for a degree in psychology because I, I thought I wanted to be um, a counselor. And that experience was um, mostly completed under the influence of drugs and alcohol. And yet I came out with high honors and I had gotten married to a gentleman I had met in, uh, in college, and we had three children. And I was not, um, I was an um, absent mother. I was in the house um, a lot of the time, but I was not present there. And lots of times I would leave the children with my husband and go out with friends and stuff and everything. Um, I got into recovery when I determined that that was detrimental not only to me, but to my family. I had missed a lot of milestones with my children. I had missed a lot of the work that my husband was doing and everything. So I just decided one day that I needed to quit. Recovery has led me to where I am today, which is somewhere that I, I, never, I never envisioned I would be. Um, I have gone, I, have, I was a director in a, a state office before I came to SAMHSA. I have spent many years in direct service as a counselor. Um, addressing both mental health and substance use disorder issues. It's given me an opportunity to realize dreams that I had that I never thought would be realized. My family and friends are always with me, no matter where I may be. Sharing stories from home helps me sustain my recovery from my mental and substance use disorder. Hey Hi, Join the voices for recovery, our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.
Welcome back. So, Kathy, we were talking before, and I know you've mentioned the whole issue of funding. Let's dig in a little bit into that. What are the complexities of the funding when we integrate? Well, I think it's actually uh, more than just the integration. It's also the delivery of certain kinds of services that people with co-occurring disorders might benefit from. So I'll give you an example. Um, in 1992, which was a long time ago, my organization was one of the first that was awarded a, a targeted capacity expansion yes. grant um, to do co-occurring services. And we did two things. Um, one of them, though, was a variable length of stay residential treatment program for people who had severe and persistent mental illness and a moderate to severe substance use disorder. So they were people who had uh, failed in a lot of other treatment opportunities. And that program ran successfully for 20 years. And there were a lot of people who had not only good outcomes when they came out of the program, but who 90 days later, and even six months later, were still doing pretty well. The fee-for-service system completely derailed that. Um, it, was a, it was program funded, so however long a person needed to stay, they could stay. When the fee-for-service system came into play, the insurance companies got to decide how long they stayed. So now no one stays more than 21 days or so, which really we haven't found that to be effective. So, But some states have found it to be um, advantageous, Donna, and I'm going to come to you, mm -hmm. to really take a look at funding streams right. and, and, and coordinate among funding yeah. streams to take care of some of those issues right. that Kathy was talking about. You want to expand on that? Yeah, and I think there are multiple ways to do that, to bring the funding streams together. I mean, we talk about blending and braiding funding. Um, as as being someone who works for the in the in the federal um, system, you can't supplant funds from one area to another f area, but you can actually braid them and blend them. You can bring in funds from all different sources from from Medicaid, from insurance, from um, mental health services, from substance use disorder services, from um, funding to support recovery supports. And some states have done an excellent job of that. Um, and the thing is that when we look at co-occurring disorders as being kind of an expectation rather than an anomaly, we need to look at what are the sources that are out there now that are paying for services for each individual and how can we bring those together to serve the greater population. Um, it's possible to do, it takes a little um it takes a little time absolutely, and some definite planning. And, and, and it takes policy changes. It, does. it takes training within both sectors to be able to work together and mm -hmm. coordinate. And, and Dr. Everett, you were talking earlier when we took the break about Washington State as an example. You want to talk a little bit about what they've done and, and how that presents a good model yep. for well, there's, integration. And there's, there's actually several states that have done a really mm -hmm. good job with that. Washington State is one that's got a statewide initiative that's looking at integrated care and doing all sorts of creative things uh, to look at that. Like what? Uh, um, promoting primary care in, uh, in disseminated throughout. And they use different models, different dissemination models to get primary care out into their settings. Mm -hmm. Another sort of general idea I wanted to kind of pick up on uh, that Kathy had mentioned earlier is this idea of fee-for-service versus some sort of grouping of funding together mm -hmm. in a bundled style or what the word exact doesn't matter but accountable care style structure. As people move into more complex chronic style conditions the fee-for-service doesn't work as well. It can work mm -hmm. fine for people who are healthier who have s visits here and there but the, the, when people get into complex addictions, multiple serious mental illness, we need to be thinking differently when how we finance the services. And so a number of, there are a number of examples of that recently. Washington State, Oregon is doing a lot of creative things with bundling uh, the way they manage services. And some of our managed care companies are actually doing really nice jobs with regards to working on people who are at the sort of the high end of the spectrum. Very so. good. Becky, uh, how is Virginia doing in terms of integration, particularly when we're talking about recovery support services? So one of the things that Virginia is doing that I think is a little bit unique, um, we are training peer recovery specialists, and the training that we have developed has been geared to train across both spectrums of mental health and substance use disorder, and to also train with the same core training for the family-to-family -family peer experience 
in that arena so that as we train that peer supporter, they're aware that their experience is not unique. So they themselves have had that experience, um, perhaps of substance use. Perhaps they grew up in the 12-step rooms, the AA model, and now all of a sudden they're realizing that um, they, they have some characteristics that might match a bipolar experience and, and that they can seek treatment for that. They can also help their fellow journeyer, their fellow traveler. So the training is geared to, to put those concepts together as we support our peers. Um, Have you found that there that people still want to remain in their silos and, and how, how what has happened in terms of breaking those silos down to be able be beyond the policy, you know, who, who really needs to take the leadership to break those silos? So I think, wow, who needs to take the leadership? <laughs> Every single one of us. Um, it, it's an interesting concept because I don't think that leadership can be from the top nor from the bottom um, and that, that really it is all of us working together until it meets in the middle. Um, people get stuck in what worked for them and there's a tendency to think about if it worked for me it has to work the same way for everybody else when in fact if you're truly doing person-centered support what you're realizing is that I know what's best that will work for me. If you give me the information, I can change my perspective. I can change my outlook. I can expand my awareness. But if I don't have that knowledge and don't have those tools, and, and that's where the experts, those that have been trained in the colleges, in the universities, the physicians, the counselors, they're the ones that can give me the tools and then I'm the one that uses those tools. So it is that marriage between having the tools and using them that, that wellness is found. And you know, we, myself included, have been using the term recovery, um, when in fact I think sometimes if we would think about rather, recovery, rather than the absence of disease, it's the presence of wellness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Donna, I, I, I want to, um, I'll follow up with that, with uh, uh, the whole aspect of the the way that SAMHSA provides funding, because I know you're in the um, uh, in, in the area that, that provides the funding under the Block Grant Program. Mm -hmm. And so what steps are being taken to support integration through those um, mechanisms? I think there are a lot of steps that are being taken. Um, you know, we are expanding and we have uh, something before us now, like with the opioid epidemic, to, to allow the states under the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant uh, to, to utilize part of their funds to, um, to set up syringe services programs, you know, to, to try and reduce some of the, the dangers of HIV infection and hep C and that and with the um, persons who inject drugs. And I think that um, not only that, but we are um, expanding the use of the block grant to include recovery support services, which is a vital piece, as, as Becky has said, you know, of the program. And then we are doing some, uh, some other, we're looking at some other ways in which we can expand those services without, you know, being in violation of the authorizing legislation and the, and the implementing regulation. But um, there are, there's a lot of flexibility and you know we've heard about some of the states and, and some of the things they're doing and they can do those things you know within the parameters that are allowed by the block grant so we're taking a lot of look uh, look at a lot of those things and we're also taking a, a look at being more integrative as far as the substance abuse block grant which has is 20 or 80 percent for treatment and 20 percent for um, minimum 20 percent for substance use disorder prevention and then working with the mental health block grant, you know, and many states now have a combined application where they can put those funds together Excellent. in a more holistic picture. Excellent. And Dr. Everett, are some of those funds for the workforce? Because I think that as we talk around this, there's one key component, which is workforce, and, and that has also to be addressed. Right. We know that workforce is a very important uh, thing. I mean, right now we're concerned uh, about the numbers of people that are that need to be available f uh, for individuals that are in need of treatment. So there's the raw numbers sort of issue. There's also uh, issues with retraining or sort of orientation of the existing workforce. And so how do we 
help the existing workforce adapt to the you know ways we think about illnesses and the ways we kind of manage uh, illnesses. And so we've we've got a multiple different areas that we're working on with regards to the workforce. But our workforce is really important. I think there's in our field in general there's a broad concern about aging out of the workforce and how do we get new people, uh, young people, uh, interested in our fields. And so we're very interested in, in working on initiatives that would support that. And when we come back, we will be talking about a little more on, on how these integrated services can better serve individuals and families. We'll be right back. It takes many hands to build a healthy life. Recovery from mental and substance use disorders is possible with the support of my community. Join the voices for recovery. Visible, vocal, valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I knew I, I, I needed help, you know. Uh, I was raised in a family where drugs was kind of prevalent. My mom smoked weed openly. And that's when I discovered uh, Frontier Health. Of course, the stigma of, of drug addiction or mental illness was something I didn't want no part of, uh, especially the mental illness part. I could uh, accept the drug addiction part more than I could the mental illness. I was at the end, I, I didn't know what to do. You know, I, I couldn't feel better. I could, drugs didn't make me feel better. Uh, the medicines they were giving me at the hospitals wasn't making me feel better. Just kept hanging on, you know. I, I just kept hanging on and uh, coming to Frontier Health and uh, seeing my case manager. And things started to change. Ultimately, helping people achieve their full potential is, is what, our, what our mission is. But if we can take a young man with a serious mental illness and a drug problem, help him heal and get better, he can be successful in school, make it through graduate school, and very quickly is on his way to being a licensed mental health professional. That, that is a good success. I think it's important as a crisis specialist to diagnose both substance abuse disorders as well as mental health disorders because you, you've got to treat the whole person and there can be so much that plays into it when, when there's both and they can feed off of each other. Yeah, I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, social phobia, and bipolar. I am currently sober and has been sober for about eight years or more. I like doing crisis work uh, because people's at their worst. You know, you see them at their worst, and a lot of times you can inst instill hope in somebody when they're at rock bottom because they don't know what else to do. And if you can say something, they may take it a long way. There's about two million people in this country that have a serious mental illness that also have a serious substance use disorder. And when you think about um, what those, those particular patients need for care, it needs to be integrated. You can't treat those two serious disorders separately. So we have toolkits. Um, we have a toolkit on um, improving care for people with co-occurring substance use disorders and mental illness. And we also have um, centers of excellence. So we have a center um, on integrated health systems that actually talks about um, and has trainings, webinars, materials on helping um, providers and payers, you know, systems of care, um, helping them figure out what they need to do to integrate both substance use disorders treatment and mental illness treatment into the broader health care system. There's a lot of overlap in terms of um, the needs of people with substance use disorders and mental illness and other kinds of conditions like heart disease, diabetes. Um, and, and the treatment can either be um, 
they could, they could interfere with each other or they could be supportive of each other if they're treated together. And so that's what we're trying to accomplish is making sure that all of the patient's needs are met um, simultaneously if that's appropriate. But if we're going to do truly integrated care, we really have to evolve to that kind of a system where we can do some problem solving, some connections, and getting people um, moving on their path in very brief periods of time. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Welcome back. Uh, Becky, we were talking about, at the end of the last panel, uh, um, resources available for individuals and families to learn more about this new integration of services and so on and so forth. Can you think of any that you can share with our audience? So the one that comes to mind first for me is SAMHSA itself. If you go onto the SAMHSA website and follow the links, there is a wealth of information about integrated care, about dual diagnosis, about recovery, um, a wealth, a wealth of information on their website. And, and why is it important for families to go in armed with this information before they even seek services? Um, is it important for, for them to know how to navigate these systems? I think it's important for them to know how to navigate the systems. I think it's important for them to learn more about what's happening with their family member. Um, they can be an ally, they can be a support, they can be a team member to that individual when they're armed with that knowledge and information. The system by itself can be a little bit scary, um, but any, any large system that takes multiple parts and puts them together has that characteristic. Um, so the more knowledge you have, the more empowered you are, the more able you are to help. Very good. Dr. Everett, we were talking about the physicians. Are there resources for practitioners who may not be in medical school but may want to learn more? Uh, yes, there's a number of resources that are there. There's a whole line of uh, particular project that SAMHSA's worked on that's called Recovery to Practice, which can be useful as a sort of a foundation uh, for clinicians uh, about that. Above and beyond that, even though this kind of notion of partnering with the person who's come to seek your services, I think is just a really important uh, notion or uh, stance to have with individuals. So, yes, there are many resources. And Kathy, for provider organizations, if they were looking for help in deciphering the system, where would they go? Well, I'm not going to talk so much, I don't think, about deciphering the system as I am about just where some of that fundamental knowledge can come from. Uh, so I swear by the SAMHSA Treatment Improvement Protocol tips, they're called, um, especially um, 35, which is motivational interviewing, 42, which is co-occurring disorders, and 43, which is medication-assisted treatment. You know them by heart. I do. Yeah. <laughs> and I ask my physicians to read them because um, sometimes uh, I've found that some of the physicians that come into this arena right now come from internal medicine or they come from other um, parts of uh, medicine, especially, especially in addictionology, and they don't really have that grounding. So the, some of those tips have a lot of really good information and they debunk a lot of myths that people have. Uh, so I, they're, they're long, that's the, the downside, mm -hmm. but they're readable and they have, I think, a lot of really good mm -hmm. content. I, I would like to add an observation that uh, when I started in this field 10 years ago and I went to research, there was nothing there. I was getting information out of Australia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when I go on board on, online and use online a lot, there is a wealth of information out there. You can use Google terms of recovery and wellness and SUD and mental health. You're finding articles on the social workers' professional websites. It's just become pervasive, mm -hmm. and it's there and available. Really, and not to mention the new Surgeon General report, yes. Donna, Absolutely. that just came out. Absolutely. And let's talk a little bit about that uh, facing addiction in America, the Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health. And they make a specific set of recommendations when it comes to the integration of services. And it noted that the substance use 
disorder community is really not ready to accept that. So how can we make it more ready to uh, support that integration? Yeah, that's absolutely true. The substance use disorder um, field has always been kind of independent. Um, I think a lot of that comes from the fact that, you know, and the Surgeon General points this out, that, that substance use disorders are a primary long-term chronic disorder, and it is a brain disease, you know, which is something that um, mental health disorder services and, and um, field developed being headed by people who had medical degrees, people who knew psychiatry, psychologists, and people who were recognized in their field as being associated with the medical um, and primary care uh, field, where as people in substance use disorder field, many of them are just people in recovery who went ahead and there were certification programs by which they could become part of the, the treatment force and everything. And I think as we progress and as things have changed, I think that profession has moved up, but many of those, many of those old ideas are still there. And if I could just add a little anecdote to that, um, uh, being a person in long-term recovery, you know, and having, um, I met a, a physician in this area when I moved here, and the language that she used to address my issues with uh, substances was um, not acceptable to me, and I told her that. You know, and I think we as people in recovery and pe as peer supports need to make be vocal about that. So what I did was I arranged to talk to her and her staff at several different junctures um, and provide them with a little training about language to use, you know. And um, it, it didn't necessarily sway the physician, but it did sway the staff. Excellent. They were, they and that's were, a start. Yes. Absolutely. And that's a start. I think we have to start, and the Surgeon General, we have to start um, where we are and move from there. Okay, excellent. Dr. Everett, very quickly, um, that was a substance use disorder from the mental health side. Are they as eager to integrate as everyone else? Um, I think it's sort of mixed overall, but I think there's been a lot more re recent research in the last 10 to 15 years that supports the collaborative care style of integration, and so I think there's a lot more attention on that uh, recently. Um, but I, I think it would be unfair to say that primary care has never been, you know, interested in substance abuse, but it's, it's, it's more recent attention on that and uh, most recent on the addictions, uh, which is good to see because I think that's very, very important. If, if, well, I, if go I ahead. could real quickly, quickly add also that I think it's the reduction of stigma that's going to open well, the doors wider. we call that discriminatory wider. practices, yes. uh, 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 you know, in, in terms of uh, behaviors and actions related to those in recovery or in need of recovery. Yeah, I think you make an excellent point. So remember I told you during the break that we're going to have uh, an opportunity for us to have some final thoughts, and it's gotten so quickly to this point. So, Becky, I'm going to start with you and, and for you to give us some final thoughts. So final thoughts would be recovery happens. It's there and available for anyone who wishes to reach out and achieve it. It'll take work. It'll take time. It'll take effort. It will take a team. But recovery does happen. Excellent. Kathy? I just want to say uh, quickly that one of the ways that I think recovery can happen is by involving families and kind of harnessing the power of families to uh, create an ecosystem around people that supports that recovery. And, and in particular, where there are two parents that are both people that are recovering and they have children, also an ecosystem to support their children and reduce the risk for their children of ultimately developing similar problems. I kind of like that, the ecosystem. Donna, final thoughts. Uh, I think both of these, both of the points that Becky and Kathy have made are very, very viable. Um, for me, recovery is an expectation. You know, we have primary care di disorders that when the doctors are able to treat them, people get recovered from those. But there's also a personal commitment that has to be made. You know, even all the people that we put together that can address these issues for people, there has to be a personal commitment on the part of the person with co-occurring disorders or with mental health disorders or substance use disorders that this is something they want. Excellent. Dr. Everett. 
Yep, for me, the recovery, the core of recovery has to do with hope uh, and uh, the idea of, you know, past an acute episode, past something happening, a person can, can live well, and that should be their expectation, their, their goal and expectation that they have and also their partnering healthcare providers have. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think that uh, you know is, is one of the best ways to work on discriminatory practices is the idea of having peers uh, involved in the workplace because then healthcare providers see individuals doing well and it rounds out their experience. Often healthcare providers are involved when people are at their worst or most unstable times and they don't often see people in recovery. So other than the direct benefit that peers have with other peers, peers can be very uh, direct but also indirect beneficiaries to the health care providers because they see people who are doing well that they may not have ever known could have sustained recovery and successful recovery 10 years past an episode. Very um, well. Well, I want to remind our audience that September is National Recovery Month, but we celebrate recovery throughout the entire year. And so we welcome uh, the engagement of our audience in this effort. You can go to recoverymonth.gov to be able to look at the new materials for this year, 2017 subservance, and you can then get engaged, get involved, because as you can see, there are many issues that are policy related and that are treatment delivery related that families and individuals in recovery can get engaged and involved in, as well as by means of extension, supporting those that are still in need of recovery. So I wanna thank you for being here. It's been a great show, thank you. To watch this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, visit the website at recoverymonth.gov. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of mental and substance use disorders, to highlight the effectiveness of prevention, treatment, and recovery services, and show that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and access other free publications and materials on prevention, recovery, and treatment services, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.